so far what we were learning about in terms of neural networks was mostly based on convolutions basically convolution operations and different var variants of it and how to combine them together using different methodology whether it's let it be inception let it be resnets let it be vgg type networks etc now i'm gonna change the focus a little bit and look at new ways of thinking about computer vision and the idea of computer vision is to make computers see like human do the idea of convolution was around since i would say 1980 and now after the abundance of data and computing power we are seeing them shine so now they're taking the field of computer vision and you can find them all over the place so they are now the mainstream but are there different ways to think about how humans see and are there any ways to improve upon convolutions so these ideas are beginning are actually emerging in our era so maybe 20 years from now or even more you're gonna see these types of ideas start to shine so i'm gonna start with two papers and then i'm sure we're gonna see a lot of cool stuff coming out of these the first one is spatial transformer networks and what is the general idea the general idea is that if you look at column a number seven for instance could be appearing anywhere in the image could be up there could be to the top right and could have any scale it could be very small or it could be very big or it could be rotated for us as human it's very easy we look at column a and we know that that's a seven we look at this five here and we know that that's a five despite the fact that it's rotated and the scale is smaller than seven we look at this six and we see that not only it's translated it is scaled it's rotated and then it's cluttered with some random stuff but our mind sort of knows how to get rid of the clutter focus on number six and say okay this image is representing a six convolution so far were good they were translation invariant and they were look actually they're locally translation invariant because of the max pooling operations that you put inside your convolution on neural networks but these are local it means that these are not sensitive to small translations but if the translation is too big then convolutions are going to get confused and they're going to make mistakes so it would be great to have a method that's able to focus basically put a box around the object of interest the box could be rotated it could be of different scales and sizes and it could ignore the clutter once you do that then it's easy to translate it you translate and focus on number seven you focus on number five and you focus on number six and then the rest of it is just a simple convolution because we know that convolutions are going to do a good job here this is not only about digits this could happen with human and self-driving cars your self-driving car sees a human that is for instance upside down for some reason or while driving it could see a truck that is upside down because of an accident and if the computer ignores that then there is going to be a huge disaster there is a question how does this relate to image segmentation we are going to cover image segmentation it's not related this is about classification. So you want to see a number seven and then classify it as a seven. Segmentation is when you have pixel wise predictions. So for segmentation, you are translating an image. Basically your input is an image. The output is still an image, but then at each pixel, you're predicting a probability. Hmm. Well, I, so I guess I didn't know the, the definition of image segmentation. I've seen classification like what we're doing here, but where the image has a whole bunch of regions and it says, okay, over here we have a cat and over here we have a car and over here we have a tree. And it would seem like that would be a precursor or a necessary step in here 
to even just be able to recognize like there's one digit in this image or two digits in this image or a digit and yeah, what a car in this image. Yeah, what you are talking about is not actually segmentation, that's object detection. And we are gonna cover object detection. You see those bounding boxes around objects in your screen. So that's what you are talking about. But if you look at that, the bounding boxes over there are just rectangular objects, so they are not rotated. Now you see the rotation here. So it's a different way of thinking. Does it answer your question? Yeah, we are gonna cover all of them. We are gonna cover segmentation, we are gonna cover object detection, etc. But for now, for a while, we are gonna stay with classification because it's gonna help us understand why deep learning works in the first place and what type of architectures we can come up with. And then we are gonna transfer our learning, whatever that we learned here, and we are gonna apply it to different problems in computer vision. So is the problem set up clear? Now, how do we do this? How do we learn to focus? There is this, that's the network architecture. That's the idea of a spatial transformer. It would be good to take the input, which could be image in terms of red, green, blue, or it could be a layer inside your convolutions. This could be the output of a convolution, which is a tensor. It would be good to take that image or that tensor, push it through a network, which could be fully connected, and predict some parameters. These parameters could be the transformation that you want to do on your image. So you're parameter parameterizing exactly what you want to see happening with some parameters theta. I'm going to specify examples of theta. Then you're going to create a grid on the output, which is parameterized by the parameters that you just predicted. You are going to use that grid to sample your initial image. Basically, you want to sample this area, and then that's going to be your output. That's going to be your uh, seven that is scaled at and centered and rotated. So what do we actually want to do? We want to have a translation and a scale and a rotation for this localization net. And does anybody know how that happens? What type of operation gives us that? Gives us a translation, scaling, rotation. So that's called an affine transformation. So this is an affine transformation. This localization network is predicting some thetas and these are our thetas, which are basically the entries of your matrix. Theta 1, 1, theta 1, 2, theta 1, 3. The first matrix is going to get multiplied by your target. T stands for target. X is the location. X and Y are the locations of pixel I. So you take pixel I, and that's going to give you the location of pixel I. Now you do an affine transformation. A stands for affine. That's going to help you rotate this matrix here. It's going to help you scale. And these two ones are going to help you translate because they are being multiplied by this one here. So you are shifting your locations. That's how your transform transformation or grid is getting parameterized by theta. GI is a point here. GI is basically XIT, YIT, and one coming from your target point. And what you're doing is mapping these points back into your source. And your source is this image. And if you are within your network, one of your layers, your source is somewhere here. So is that transformation clear? That's how you're generating a grid. That's going to be your grid. And these are the locations of your grid, X, I, T, Y, I, T. And this could be anywhere inside your output. So we are putting a grid. And this grid is going to as get associated with the original, with the source grid through a transformation, through an affine transformation. Is this clear? Does this make sense? Okay, perfect. So just to be clear, this, this um, A matrix maps from the target space back to the source space? Yes, because the objective is to know what is the value of a pixel here? What is the value of a pixel here? And then you want to read it off with, from the correct location, from source. What yeah, is the value of this? Still seems, it still seems backwards to me. Like we want to learn the, the mapping which straightens out and centers these digits. Uh, so the network is not going to go through that. The network is going to go through the sampler. This is where you're going to get V, the inputs. Basically, the output is going to go through this route. 
through the sampler. This is just to help you put a grid on your locations. Because what do we want to do? What is the size of this? I think it's going to get more clear if I tell you a little bit more, and then you're going to see how the network is going to do the transformation. How do you get the, take the input and output V? How do you get V? That's your question. Yes. And there is another question from Play. Do we have to apply some interpolation after the affine transformation? Perfect. So now you are thinking ahead. And that's exactly what I just unraveled in this slide. You do an interpolation. You do a bilinear interpolation. And it's called bilinear sampling. Does that answer your question, Blake? OK. Let's see how you get the value at a particular channel and at a particular location on that channel at a particular pixel. That pixel, you want to copy and paste it from your input. You want to take it from you. So you do a summation over u for that particular channel of pixel n and m. So you take a pixel in a particular channel, you put it here. The rest of the stuff here is for linear or bilinear interpolation. Let's take a look at it more carefully. If xis is equal to m, this term is going to end up being 1. If yis is equal to n, that term is going to be equal to 1. And you are just copying u and m on that particular channel to your current pixel. So you're just copying. So this is when you're lucky. And your transform, maybe this point, just transforms on a point here. And then you're lucky. And why did I ignore the summation? The answer is this function, these maximum ones, are most of the time zero, except near the neighborhood of xis and yis. Most of the time, these terms are zero. That's why this summation goes away, and you're just copying your input to the output. So that's like a convolution with some kind of like pyramid function. The ith pixel is the u and m pixel convolved with, or the u matrix convolved with that like downward opening pyramid function. Yes. So that's a pyramid. You're right. And okay. that's, your, that's how you do, for those of you who know finite elements, that could be basically one of your elements. So you have a pyramid, and then you're just multiplying by that. And it's linear. So if you, you, look, you look at it in one dimension, most of the times it's zero. Then there is a peak, it goes down, and then it's zero again. So these, fun these functions are like that. You're doing linear interpolation, but locally. It's local linear interpolation. But why is it bilinear? Because you have two of them. It's in two dimensions. OK, is that clear? Now, what if you are unlucky and this is not exactly equal to m and this is not exactly equal to n? So you're just doing a linear interpolation if you're unlucky. And that's how you get your v values. So that's your transformation now. Now you see why you need that operation to be backward, because you want to know the value of xis. And what is YIS? OK, is that clear? Any questions? That's your chance to ask questions. I'm a little confused. Um, so if we're using XIS and YIS, and we've, we've learned essentially the, the A theta matrix, but we need our sort of our, I mean, where are we getting this XIT and YIT from? Because we need the rotated and translated coordinates. That's a great question. What is XIT? XIT, you know it. For instance, it's one and one for the first pixel. You know your target XI, but you want to know what is the value at that location. XI and YI, you know them. It's one, 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 two, pixel one, two, pixel one, three, or pixel, I don't know, 256 and uh, one. So these values, you know. Mm -hmm. OK, that makes what sense. What you don't know is uh, the corresponding value at that location. The locations you know. These are your pixels. You don't know the value that you want to put there. And the value is going to come from the input, which is u, and a linear interpolation or a bilinear interpolation. That's why vis is a function of u and the source pixels. OK. And we learn this transformation from our output space to our input space so that we can grab the, the right pixel value. Exactly. Okay. So you need to know this uh, mapping from 
your pixels because these pixels you know to the input so that you can copy and paste. All right, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. And the question was, how are H and W defined? And thank you, Sorish, for answering. These are the height and the width. They, these two terms, U and V, have the same H and W, the height and the width of your input. And I is also counting your pixels. I could have had I and J for two pixels, but you can actually put everything in one large column and count them with a single index. Does that answer your questions? So I think now everything is clear how the setup works, at least when you go forward in your neural network. When you want to go backward, what happens? So now the confusion is about tau theta. What is that? That is how you are corresponding the pixels in your target to the pixels in your source. Tau is just exactly this matrix. Tau is equal to A of theta is equal to this matrix here. What it does, it does the rotation, the translation, and the scaling. So it's gonna help you focus on the region of interest. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's just a translation operation, transformation operation. It's gonna generate a grid for us. And the grid is parametrized by thetas. And GI is notation for the ith grid point in target space. Exactly. So the ith grid point, GI, is just XIT and YIT. And that one here is just to save you some notation so that you can write things nicely. So Rush has another question, but is it, what is that on all of the input or a subset of it? It's on all of these pixels, how you map a pixel in your target to your source. So it's on all of these points. This transformation is transforming the axis. So far, I'm, I'm, I know you were used to seeing convolutions and they were always ap being applied on the values of tensors. Now, what we are doing is looking at the coordinates of those tensors. We are looking at the indices. These transformations are on the indices. And this function could be everywhere, but then when you map it, it's just gonna focus on some particular part of your image. Exactly. So that's the correct way to think about it. The output V is the same as the same size as U, exactly, but have come from a subset of points in U. Perfect. Now you got it. Everybody else get the same idea? Awesome. So we are on the same page. Now the question is how do you backpropagate through this operation? That's how you do it. You want to take the derivative of, that's what you need, the derivative of VIC with respect to a particular point in your input with respect to that. The summation stays. The summation stays because of these terms depending on M and N, but then the derivative is gonna cancel. That's gonna give you a one. The derivative with respect to this term is just the one. Okay, how do you take the derivative with respect to XIS? Because that's what we need. How does the network backpropagate through this translation? You get a, let's say you want to do with respect to XIS, with respect to YIS is similar. If you do with respect to XIS, that's the only part of your function that depends on XIS. And the derivative of that function is either zero because your function is zero, your function is like this. It's zero linear with a negative slope and then zeros again. Then if you are on the upward part of your linear transformation, the derivative is one. If you are on the downward slope, that's gonna be a negative one. And that's gonna give you a derivative. And how derivatives are gonna get back propagated through a spatial transformer. Why is it useful? After incorporating single and multiple transformers, for single, what happens? You just have a transformation on the input, on the pixels. For multiple of them, you do the same thing for uh, different layers. And then you can reduce the error rate to 3.6. And that's a huge gain. From 4 to 3.6, that's a huge gain for different pixel values also. I mean, uh, size of your image. But what is a data set? The data sets are street view house numbers. So the question from Matt is max out CNN just the CNN with the original max out or something different? You can take a look at that paper and look at citation 10. 
go inside this paper, spatial transformer network, citation 10, and that's gonna give you the source. Yes, it's this paper, but by good fellow during his PhD. And there is just one max out layer towards the end. And as I said, you can have, this is, these are street view house numbers. And the objective is to read these numbers, 260 and output 260. There are a bunch of transformers or tra yeah, transformer operations. That's the first one, that's the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. These are happening in four consecutive layers, one right after the input, another one right after the first convolution, another one after the second convolution, another one after the third convolution. And you can uh, combine those operations and that's gonna give you a box around uh, the actual number. After the transformation, you get a nice rectangular image that you can easily classify. But the classification here is slightly different to what you're used to. You're gonna have three, actually five, different softmax for five digits. One, two, three, four, five digits. And usually these numbers are from uh, zero to nine. And you can have a blank or a space also. So now you're predicting 11 objects. Zero, one, two, up until nine. This is 10 digits and a blank. And then you have five different of them, five different softmax. And in the end, the multiplication, because these objects are independent, independent, the digits, you just multiply those probabilities together to get the probability, a single probability out of your network. And if the network decides that it has to put a bunch of blanks, it's gonna put the blanks. It's gonna predict the first one as a blank. It's gonna predict a two, a six, a zero, and perhaps another blank. And then that's gonna be read as two, six, zero. Is that clear? Any questions about the loss function? I just have a question about um, sort of the structure with multiple spatial transformers. Um, it seems kind of surprising to me that you would want multiple sort of embedded deeper in your network. It would seem like you would want to transform your image and then do your processing kind of in separate parts. Is there a reasoning for having multiple transformers spread throughout? Yeah, that's the reasoning. If they used a single transformer, that's their error rate, 3.7. If they use multiple of them, that's 3.6. So just empirically? Yep. Do you know if anyone's tried putting all of the spatial transformations first and then all of the, the convolution, the rest of like the network, instead of having this sort of like hop between this alternation? You mean four STs on top of each other? And yeah, then, yeah. But that's gonna end up being a single ST. These are linear operations. So then why not just have a single, I guess it just works better in practice. Yeah. So that's the single oh. and they have done it. Okay. Yeah, that's a valid point. If you do a bunch of affine transformations in a row, it's the same as one big affine transformation. But if you put nonlinearities after each affine transformation, it has a different effect. It's, it's no longer just one big affine transformation applied to those convolutions or, or nonlinearities. Uh, yes, that's a fair point. So after your affine transformation, do a nonlinearity and then do your second affine. Maybe that's a good idea to explore. The idea is simple to implement. Maybe implementation wise, that's a very nice, that could be a very nice exercise. Any other questions about the loss function that we are writing? The idea is that you have five soft max getting multiplied together to give you, to give you your probability. And then once you know your probability, you know your likelihood, you can maximize the likelihood or minimize the negative of the log of the likelihood. Any questions? So that's one way to have multiple transformers. Can you guys think of a different way to put multiple transformers in your network? This is sequential. Is there another way of doing it? So if you have like a wider network with like multiple paths? I think you're close. What if you had a seven and a five as your input in a single image. You can segment the image and then do affine transformations over the segmented portions of the image. Uh, that's what Surush is also saying. Split the image up initially, but how do you know how to split it? 
the idea is that the network has to learn how to split, where to focus, because these two numbers could appear anywhere in your image and they could be cluttered. We still want to use this spatial transformer, but we want to use multiple of them. If we know beforehand that there are gonna be two numbers per image, what can we do? Can you use two networks and link them together in some way? So we want to have two spatial transformers. What you can do is you can have, this is your first spatial transformer. You can have another one, perhaps down here. And then you can take U and push it through that spatial transformer. So now you have two of them. And you have two of them in parallel. And one of them can focus on a number. Another one can focus another, on another digit. And then everything is going to happen on the fly through training. How can you guarantee they don't select the same region? You cannot guarantee. The way that you guarantee is through training. Everything here is, is example-based. And the network can make mistakes. So you just show it enough examples and then hope the best is gonna happen. There is no guarantee. Does that answer your question? Yes, no? Yep. Okay, perfect. And that's exactly what these guys do. You can have two, a blue box and a red box, and then you can try to classify the birds, different types of birds. And that's tough because these are fine grained details. You're not just saying that that's a bird, you're saying what type of bird that is. Even for human, that's tough. You need to do a PhD in that field. And the way that these two, for instance, if you have two spatial transformers, the network is gonna learn to focus on different parts. For instance, the red one is focusing on the head, except for this. And this goes back to Sorush's question, how do you make sure that they are not focusing on the same thing? The red one, the intuition is that it's focusing on the head, for most of the images except for one. And the blue box is focusing on the body. Each one has a different type of a body. And that's an outlier. Same thing is here. The, is the learnable region or the, the region that is amplified from these affine transforms then dependent on every single image that goes in? Like if you gave it a if you gave this this network on the left, like a, a seven, but it was somewhere else in the image, would it still with the same training? be able to identify like that that hot zone where the seven is? Or is it always just gonna learn that the seven goes in the top left and it'll look in the top left? That's an awesome question. I was waiting for it. That's a great question. These thetas depend on the image. These are functions of you. These are functions of the input image that goes in. These are not fixed for your entire data set. These change per input image. That's and really clever. So like when the, when the seven comes in in a different spot, the image is different. So the affine transformation is different and it figures out then how to find where the seven is. Yes, exactly. That's amazing. It is amazing. Yes. Yeah, because that's what it's learning in the localization network is how to, is that function. Exactly. So it's learning this function. And the point is that this is a function. And it's a function of your input. For a different view, for a different set of mini batch, this is gonna be different. This is not fixed for your entire data set. And look at the improvement. And the more of these boxes you have, the more accurate your network is getting. I think we are one minute over time. For those of you who have questions and want to stay and ask, you are more than welcome. And for those of you who want to leave, you can leave. My only question is about um, in the top right diagram where it's got the, the, the STs going to a convolution, going to an ST, going to a convolution and so on. What, what are those back links then down to like the X, the X like the, the four STs all point back down to an X, which points down to the, the box with the 260 in it? The first one is obvious, yes, because you're taking your pixels and mapping it back to your input. So that's gonna give you this box. The second one is gonna take the output of the second layer map it to a box, then you take that box and map it back to your initial image. This one, you know the pixels. The key observation is that you know these XITs, YITs. So is it just inverting back through whatever three or four or five layers of spatial transformation or is it, is it, because the arrows make it seem like they just 
go once to one pixel? Uh, no, it's just a way of combining them. But, but always if it was like the nth spatial transformation, you'd go back through the n minus first and back through the n minus second, all the way back to the first exactly. to get back to the original pixel. Yes. OK. And, uh, there is another observation. In one particular layer, h and w are going to remain the same, the width and the height. But then when you go to the other layer, there is usually a downsampling happening. Because of the convolution, yeah. Because of max pooling or whatever. Yeah. Then you need to upsample first and then take that and go back. So it's likely the case that one, one pixel at like the fourth layer down is going to back propagate to like four pixels, which back, back propagate to 16 and, and so on. It grows. Yes, to the size of the image. That's interesting. That's really cool. Yeah. And that's how you get these box. Yeah, very cool. The question is, can we swap the bilinear sampling with another interpolation? Of course. So this is just the easiest way out of the method. Copy and paste and do bilinear. There is another one that you can just copy the nearby pixels. So does that answer your question? Perfect. 